All right, so uh, over the past couple of days, we have looked at um, resistor circuits and we've looked at capacitor circuits and kind of like how to work those out using a conceptual basis to make mathematical statements and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's all well and good um, and important that you understand, but um, there's also an easier way to do this. Uh, so the easier way to do it is to not have to worry about the, uh, all the rules so much, but instead just be able to take a circuit uh, not have to think through what its structure is like, and instead just translate that into mathematical statements and then to solve a system of equations. Um, it turns out that's actually really easy to do. You just need these things called Kirchhoff's laws. So um, after you've learned these laws, the way that I talked about this last couple of days is obsolete because all you'll have to do is apply these two rules to write mathematical statements about your, uh, your circuit. And then you can just like shove those into a calculator and let the calculator solve the system for you. So it's a much easier way to do this, or at least it's a much less uh, thinky way to do it. You can just kind of like beat it to death with math. So it's a nice little system. So um, let's talk about Kirchhoff's laws uh, and get into it. So again, the big picture here is you're just going to do math instead of having to think about the physics. And all you have to do is remember these basic rules. Uh, we're going to do one uh, set of slides to talk about uh, how you do this with the resistors. We'll do another set of slides to talk about how you do this with capacitors. What you'll see is it's basically the same thing, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's whatever. All right, so, uh, I, I will stop you for a moment because I want you to know there are two, uh, two laws. There's the junction law and there's the loop law. Sometimes these are called rules. It's the same thing. Um, in, in like science, a law is a mathematical statement lacking an explanation, um, and that's what this comes down to, is we can translate into mathematical statements without caring a whole lot about an explanation, just like, hey, this is the way that it works. All right, so uh, getting into it. The first rule is called the junction rule, and it relies on this idea of conservation of charge. So like in all of our circuits, we saw that whatever current comes in, um, must split, divide, whatever, but whatever current comes in must come out. That is um, all that the junction rule is. It's taking that simple concept that whatever current is coming into a junction must come out of a junction, right, which is just conservation of charge, and it's putting it into a mathematical statement. Um, most often you'll see people write it this way, that the total current in is equal to the total current out. That's totally fine, but I actually prefer to write it this way, that the total current for any junction is equal to zero. Now what you're going to see here as we start looking at different things, do I have a slide for this? I don't. Um, what you're going to see as we, as we go through this is that y'all are basically going to have to decide which way you think the current is going. We're going to see some really complex circuits now that we know Kirchhoff's laws. Um, so you're not always going to be right, and that's okay. I'm going to talk that through with an example for you in a moment, but, but understand that um, you just make your best guess, and then you put it in the equation, and then it'll work out. Because what's going to happen is, if your current comes out as a negative value, that means the current was flowing the opposite direction from what you thought it was, and that's okay. It's not a big deal, all right? So, we're just going to write mathematical statements, make your best guess, and move on. Because you'll see some arrangements that we really won't know for sure which way the current's flowing. Um, so let's take a, a simple circuit, though, like this. If I was going to use Kirchhoff's uh, junction rule here, I would see that there are two junctions, right? B and E. A junction is anywhere that the current is dividing or coming back together. So notice... I've got what we would call a node at C and D, but there's, there's no dividing or coming together of, of current there, so I wouldn't write any statements there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what you have to do in order to use Kirchhoff's laws is the first thing you have to do is you have to basically make, uh, like go through the circuit and map out how the current is flowing. So that's really simple. I'm just going to start and say like, all right, the current flowing here, I'm going to call current 1. And I know that current one is going to keep going until it divides. And then I'm arbitrarily going to call this 
branch then current two, and this branch current three. And that's it. So as I go around, I'll keep following current three, and I'll see it hits another junction here where it's recombining with current two, and so what's coming out of it must be current one again. You can also confirm that by following it through and seeing, yeah, it flows through that same pathway. So all you have to do is go through and kind of map out how the current is flowing. You don't have to understand anything about it besides knowing where it's coming together and going apart, and then you can write mathematical statements. So, when I go to write mathematical statements here, I could write a statement for junction B, and for that, what I would say is that um, all of these have to add to zero. The way that I typically do this, and there's a reason I use that second statement. Let me actually say that first. If you do the second statement, it makes it easier to put them into your calculator. That's why I don't go with n equals out. Instead, I make it to where they all add up to zero, because that's going to give me an easier way to put it in the calculator. So what I will decide is anything that I think is going into the junction, I'm going to count as positive. Anything that I think is going out of the junction, I'm going to count as negative. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, right? It'll come out just fine. Um, as long as you keep consistent with the way you thought the current was flowing. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to say, all right, that's into the junction. So I'm going to count I1 as positive, and then I2 and I3 are both coming out. So I'm going to count those as negative. So minus I2 minus I3 equals zero. So there's the statement that I get for junction B. I can go look at junction E, and I can write a statement for that one. And if I do that, then I see I2 and I3 are positive, and I1 is negative. So I'm going to write it this way. Negative I1 plus I2 plus I3 equals zero. Now those among you who are decent at the mathematics may look at that and realize those are the same statement. I've just multiplied one of them by negative one. So you'll see this a lot with the junction rule where not every statement adds information. So you want to be able to look out for that because then I could kind of eliminate one of those equations to make my system easier to solve, right? So you have to have a bit of a keen eye to say, oh, these are the same thing, right? And because of that, I can discount the junction E equation and just use the junction B equation or vice versa. It really doesn't matter. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the junction rule. All I'm doing is I'm looking through the circuit. I'm deciding here are all the currents that are flowing and the way I think that they're flowing. And I'm going to keep consistent with that direction, right? That's the key is consistency. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong as long as you're consistent with the way you think current is flowing. You can't mix it up midstream. All right. Now, again, uh, here's, here's a junction that I wanted to use to model to show that like, the direction is arbitrary. I could decide that at that node, all of those currents are going into the node. And that clearly must be wrong, right? Like the current can't be all going in. One or two of those have to be going out. But if I have no way to tell, then I just have to make a choice. If I say that all of those currents are going into the node, and I count them as just like I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus I4 plus I5 is equal to zero, then all that's going to happen is when I solve that system later, one or two or three of those are going to come out as negative, and then I would know, whoops, that one was actually going out of the node, and that's okay, because you'll know that when it comes out as a negative. Does that make sense? Just make sure again, what's important is not that you're right about the direction of current flow, what's important is that you're consistent with the way that you draw it flowing. Does that make any sense? Okay. All right, so that's the junction rule. The junction rule is the easier one. The loop rule is a little bit tougher, but it's gonna rely on this idea that around any closed path, the total voltage has to be zero, right? Um, which we basically said for circuits before, but it turns out that's true not just for circuits, but any closed loop. For any closed loop, all the voltage around that loop has to add up to zero, and the loop direction determines the sign. Okay, so a couple things here. One, you have to make sure that you've already got your current flow mapped out before you do this. Okay? Second, you can draw the direction of your loops completely arbitrarily, <coughs> as long as, again, once you draw the loop, you keep it. Okay? And the direction the loop goes is going to determine your current. Um, what you'll see when you use the junction rule in conjunction with the loop rule is that you get a bunch of uh, mathematical statements and you don't need all of them, right? So for example, if, if I have three currents in a circuit, y'all should be comfortable with the idea that I really only need 
three equations. I don't need like four, five, or six. So you might get four, five, or six equations. Just pick the three that make the most sense, right? And this is where that would be important for me to know. If I have a list of five equations here, including these two, it would be good for me to know, like, okay, these are the same equations, so I shouldn't use that one. Does that make sense? All right. So here's how this works. If you imagine uh, a circuit like the one that we looked at before that has these resistors, right? Um, every single loop that I can draw using my finger, right, where I can trace the circuit to get back to where I started, that's a loop. So notice here, I can start here and work around the inside. That's one loop. I can start at B and work around the inside here, get back to B. That's another loop, right? Um, I can also start at A and follow this all the way around, and that's another loop. Does that make sense? Um, I've already kind of covered this loop here and that loop there. Uh, and again, I've already covered that loop there. So as long as you trace it and come back to where you started, around that loop, the total voltage should be zero. You okay with that? Okay. Now here's where things get a little bit weird. So I want the total voltage around that loop to add up to zero, and I need a, I need a consistent way of writing mathematical statements to represent that voltage. So I'm doing all these things in terms of current, right? And so we should be okay with the idea that those voltage drops I'm gonna put in in terms of Ohm's law then, right? So every voltage drop I put in, I'm not gonna put necessarily just V, I'm gonna put the current multiplied by the resistance. Does that make any sense? And what I need to know is when I put those voltage drops in, what is going to go in as a, a positive change in voltage and what's going to go in as a negative change in voltage. And the short answer here is that you think about the way it's behaving in the circuit. And if your loop agrees with the current flow, then it goes in as that sign. So for example, typically, now I'm following the flow of current, I would think about battery as a voltage lift, right? It's increasing the energy. I would think of a resistor as a voltage drop. It's using energy, if you want to think of it that way. And so as long as the loop direction is in the same direction as the current, then I end up with putting those statements in the way that would make sense. So a battery goes in as a positive voltage, um, a resistor goes in as a negative voltage, and that's totally fine. Where it gets different is when the loop direction disagrees with the current direction, and then you just flip the sign. Does that make any sense? Okay. So you can see that that's really all this picture is telling you, is that normally if my current is flowing this way, then I would think of this as a voltage drop. And so if my loop direction is in the same direction, so from A to B, then I would put it in as minus IR. Because that's how I would calculate the voltage there, is current times resistance. If instead my current is flowing the opposite direction, but I'm still looking at my loop going from A to B, well, now those disagree. So instead of putting it in as a voltage drop as, you know, minus IR, I'm going to put it in as a voltage lift or plus IR. Does that make any sense? You can also see that with the batteries, right? So normally if I'm going from little side to big side, that means the voltage is going up across the battery. And so that would go in as a positive. Well, if the loop and current direction disagree, then you just put it in the other way. Does that make sense? And again, you start by mapping on the circuit and doing your best. And then if it, if it turns out you were wrong about the current direction, as long as you were consistent, it'll come out in the end. You'll just need to look out for when your current is negative, you were wrong about which way you thought the current was flowing. Does that make any sense? Okay. All right, so here are the steps that you should go through when you're using Kirchhoff's rules. Let me make sure I still got plenty of time on my video here. Yeah, I got 14 minutes. That should be fine. Siri, start a 12 minute timer. All right, so the first thing you have to do in order to use Kirchhoff's rules is you've got to start by mapping out which direction you think the current is flowing. Don't overthink it, don't stress about it, get it done quickly, right? If you're taking the AP test, you don't have time to overthink it, so just go through and be like, all right, the current's going this way, I'm gonna say it splits and goes this way, and then just keep following it, and it'll be fine. Don't overthink it, just make sure you're consistent with your current flow directions. 
Once you've done that, you can write your junction rule equation. So go look at every junction. And remember, a junction is where current is either combining back up or splitting out. Write a junction statement for all of those. That's where you'll get a lot of duplicates. Okay? Don't stress about it. Just write them out. And then you should be smart enough to identify when they're duplicates, because those are normally simple statements. So you just want to look out for stuff like this. Where it's like, okay, they both use I1, 2, and 3, and the signs are flipped. So I only need one of those statements. Once you've got those, then you're going to write your loop equations. So go in, draw loops. I like to stick to uh, clockwise loops, just as a general rule that makes it easier for me to think about. Um, if you want to do that, that's fine. If you want to like mix up the directions, that's fine too. It really doesn't matter. Uh, that's just what you'll typically see me do. Then what you do is you select your equations, right? So for the circuit I was talking about before, there's only three currents. And so I really only need three equations. I just want to make sure I don't pick any duplicates because that would make an unsolvable system, right? So that's it. You pick three equations that aren't duplicates and you put in the calculator and you let it solve it for you. Now what you'll see is that y'all will see some stuff that's pretty wacky here. Like you might have like seven or eight equations. So one, no one wants to solve that by hand, right? So what we're going to be doing instead is we're going to be taking those equation systems and writing them in a matrix and then having your um, calculator do that like reduced row echelon form thing where it'll be like, you know, 1 equals blah, 0, 1 equals blah, 0, 0, 1 equals blah, and then you have all the answers. So like, you're not going to solve the system. You're going to let the calculator do it. Now here's what might happen. You might get a system back that says, hey, this wasn't solvable, right? Really what that means is one of two things. Either one, if it returns no solutions, you messed up when you were making your equations and you need to go try again. If you get back like infinitely many solutions, that means that you had two duplicate equations and therefore there was not enough information. Right? So go pick different equations. Does that make sense? So look out for those results. Either you'll get a nice thing that comes out and it's like, ooh, that looks really good, or you'll get something that basically tells you there's no solutions, something that tells you there's infinitely many solutions, and that's how you respond to those things. Okay? So create a matrix, reduce row echelon form, and you're done. Right? That's how we do this. So this is a fairly automatic process. All you have to know is a few basic rules. Go write the equations, put it in the calculator, let the calculator do it for you. That's it. Does that make any sense? Okay. Um, I'm going to show you what this looks like for that circuit uh, back here. It's a really simple one, but I, I think it'll just it'll give you the idea, right? So for this, I'm going to make up some numbers so that this is uh, an actual solvable thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say that um, the voltage here, I'm going to say, is 50 volts. Uh, let's go 100 ohms for R1, 50 ohms for R3, and yeah, 50 ohms for R2. So I'm just making up some numbers. So the first thing I would want to do is map the current. They've already done that, but I'll show you what that would look like. I typically will start with like, hey, there's a battery. I'm going to call this current 1. And so everywhere along here, current 1 is following this direction. I'm then going to say that I think what happens at junction B is that current 1 splits into 2, and it's going to flow through that same direction. So here's current 3 that's going to follow all the way around until I hit that junction. Here's current 2 that's going to come around until I hit that junction. I have common sense, and I knew that 1 split into 2 and 3, so when 2 and 3 combine, that must be 1 again. right? So there's current 1 following through this direction. Are we okay with that? Okay. So that's where I've split up all my current and my junctions. So I'm going to go ahead and write down my junction rules. I'm going to do this uh, in terms of actual numbers, right? So what I'm going to say is that for junction B, I'm going to get this equation, which we already wrote down. I2, sorry, I1 minus I2 minus I3 equals 0. We already said that the junction for E does not help me, so I'm not going to worry about that one. Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's do loops. So I'm going to say that I see three loops here. One, two, and then a big third. So I'm going to draw my loop this direction. Um, I'm going to draw this loop this direction. And then the big loop, I'm going to go all the way around the outside um, clockwise. That's kind of hard to draw on here where you can see it, but let's just do my best. There. Cool? So I'm going to go through and try and write out my statements. So 
Uh, I should label these, by the way. I'm going to call this loop one, loop two, loop three. So I'm going to start with loop one. And so look at the loop direction here. It's going this way. My predicted current direction is that current one is following this path. And so this battery then, because the current direction and the loop direction agree, that's going to go in as a positive voltage. So I'm going to write it as 50. A positive 50. You okay with that? I'm going to keep following the loop, and then I hit resistor 1. Right? Resistor 1, the loop direction and the current direction agree. So that means that resistor must be using up voltage, and so I'm going to make it a voltage drop. So I'm going to say it's minus the current times the resistance. The resistance here is 100 ohms, and the current is I1. So I'm going to put minus 100 I1. Are we OK with that? We're cool with how I arrived at that conclusion? OK, I keep following the loop, and I hit resistor 2. Again, the current direction and the loop direction agree. So I'm going to call that a voltage drop again. So it's going to be minus current 2 times R2. R2 is 50. So it's going to be minus 50 I2. We cool with that? Keep following the loop. There's no more elements along the loop. And I eventually get back to the battery. So now my loop is terminated. And so that's equal to 0. We cool with how I got that equation? Let's do an equation for loop two. So I drew it where I'm starting here. So the first element I'm going to go through is R2. Now check this out. When I go through R2, my current is down. My loop is up. So I'm going to reverse my rules. So now instead of thinking of resistors as voltage drops, I'm going to think of it as a voltage lift. And so instead of putting it in as minus IR, I put it as plus IR. So I'm going to make it. Uh, I2 times R2, which is 50 I2. We came with that, and I put it in as a positive. So 50 I2. I follow my loop around, and the next thing I hit is C, where the loop direction and the current direction agree. So that's a resistor, that means it's a voltage drop. So I'm going to put minus uh, 50 R3. Sorry, whoopsies. I3. I keep following that around, I get back up there, my loop terminates, so that must be equal to zero. We cool with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I do the big loop. So the big loop I follow around and I hit my battery first. I mean I guess I started up here, so let's be consistent and you know do that. I follow it around, I hit R1 first, current direction and the loop direction agree, so that must be a voltage drop. So it's going to be minus 100 I1. Keep following it around. The next thing I hit is this resistor R3. Current direction and loop direction agree. So it's going to be minus 50 I3. Keep following this around. And I get back over here to the battery. The battery, the current direction and the loop direction agree. So that must be a voltage lift. So I'm going to say plus 50. And then I get back to where I started, so that's equal to zero. So there are all of my equations. We cool with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, now here's where you have to pick equations that give you enough information to solve the system. Okay? So I've got one equation that involves all three, so that's probably a good one to keep. Notice that the rest of these equations only involve two. See that? Um, also notice that this equation doesn't involve the battery. So sometimes with Kirchhoff's rules, there's a little bit of trial and error because we should know that I only need three equations and I have to kind of pick the right three. Pick the ones that you think work, put them in a matrix, put them in the calculator, see what it spits back. If it spits back something you don't like, go pick a different one. Right? It's fine. It's not that big of a deal. Just keep trying it. Does that make any sense? Um, what I think will have the most success is I've got... I1, I2, I1, I3, and I've got that guy. I'm just going to pick those three. It may not work. I really don't know the best way to pick them, but these are the ones that I'm going to choose. And then I'm going to put them into a matrix. Okay. So remember that when you write out your matrices, basically we've got a column for I1, 
a column for I2, a column for I3, and then a column for the numbers, right? So when I go to put those in, I'll start with this one. One is the coefficient, then these both have coefficients of negative one, and so I'm gonna have one, minus one, minus one, zero. That's how I put it in the matrix. When I look at this guy, my number is 50, but watch out here, because I would have to move that to the other side, which would make it negative 50. So then my number is negative 50. My I1 is minus 100. My I2 is minus 50, and my I3 is zero. Now the clever amongst you may see that this is slightly more satisfying if I make all those negatives positives, and so that's perfectly appropriate to do. You can do that. Cool with that? Okay, let's take this statement here. Um, I've got minus 100. I don't have an I2. My I3 is minus 50. And then notice that if I move that over, that's going to be a negative 50. And then just like before, I can take that whole equation and multiply it by negative 1, and then I get something that just looks a little bit nicer. And so now, here's my matrix that I put into the calculator, and I let it do the reduced row echelon form thing. And what it should spit out to me is this. And what that's translating to is I1 is equal to this number. I2 is equal to that number. I3 is equal to that number. And now you have your answers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If that comes out um, with something else, don't stress about it. Just go pick more equations. Uh, if, you, if you do that like two or three times and you're still not getting a good result, then probably what that means is that you just goofed on your equation somewhere. Go back and try again. Does that make any sense? Yes. Questions, comments, concerns about Kirchhoff's laws for resistors. Okay, so that's, that's how you do it. Yeah.